I was born in this house. I grew up here. There's a river behind the house and a meadow. <coughs> this is a hotel now, but it has been in family possession for about a hundred years until my family sold it. My family was minor aristocratic. They organized hunting parties and society events in the countryside. Yeah. This was my window. I lived here with three of my sisters. And the house was sold when I was nine. After that, we moved to London. And we lived in this house for half of the year at least. Um, the time of the season when we had to attend, I don't know, society events, charity dinners, um, and stuff like that. For the other part of the year, we would live in country houses. Um, my family had extreme wealth, but I always felt kind of, I don't know, dissociated from it, and I didn't really like it so much. Um, my sisters and my father were fascist supporters and strong admirers of Hitler. This is me and my sisters. Um, this is me. This is Nancy, Diana, Unity, and Pamela. Diana and Unity are, were really close to Hitler's circles and kind of part of the British upper class that was um, close to the Nazis. Nancy, like myself, would become a writer. I never really felt very comfortable in my family, and we had a lot of fights, and from a really young age on, I um, attended kind of leftist youth groups in London. And, um, yeah, I decided that I couldn't live with my family, and I ran away, and I moved to the United States. First, I lived in Washington um, during the years of the war. But then I moved to the Bay Area, to Oakland. And I married a labor union lawyer and activist Robert Troyhaft. Actually, let me turn this off. We moved into this house. The one with the red. I worked for the East Bay Civil Rights Congress, which was a nonprofit um, civil rights organization that organized demonstrations. And represented a lot of workers and um, a lot of African Americans in court. Um, mostly African Americans from the South that were faced with an all-white jury and 
highly questionable charges. And we kind of try to make this um, their cases public to raise attention to the um, racial differences and racism in the country. Throughout McCarthyism, the, CR, the Civil Rights Congress was weakened strongly and it had to, abandon, had to be abandoned in 1956. Um, Bob and I were both uh, had to testify in front of the House of Un-American Activities and we decided to leave um, the Civil Rights Congress and the Communist Party that we were a part of to become activists on our own, on our own terms. Um, while Robert was defending uh, labor union workers, he, he became aware of the type of exploitation that existed in the death industry. Okay, so we're in the United States. It's different than in Europe. The funeral homes and the cemeteries are all profit-run uh, uh, yeah, companies and organizations. So they're not state-owned, like the cemeteries in Germany, for example. And their, the prices that they were charged were extremely high, un unreasonably high. And a lot of the, um, I don't know, death pensions that, that a lot of un uh, union workers fought for in trial would end up at the end in the pockets of undertakers and cemetery businesses. And to kind of um, fight this situation and, and to make people become aware of it, Bob founded the Bay Area Funeral Society, which was a nonprofit funeral co-op that allowed its members to kind of collectivize, um, collectivize their money and, and allow it for a, for a cheap and simple funeral. Through Bob, I became really aware of this fact, and I started researching, and I started meeting with cemeteries and with members of the death industry. And I published a little article in, in a San Francisco newspaper. It didn't raise much attention. Um, but then I was invited to an interview, um, to a TV interview, and that gained huge attention. And then I got um, a lot of offers to publish a book about it, and decided to research for a while. And in 1963, I published The American Way of Death, which became a New York Times number one bestseller for weeks. One of the most extraordinary places during the research and that, I'm, and that I describe in the book is Forest Lawn Cemetery. Look at this place. This is Los Angeles. The city is Glendale. Uh huh. There was on. And this is Forest Lawn. This is where you enter. Let's drive into Forest Lawn. 
Uh, for Aslan has self-proclaimed the largest metal gate in the world. <coughs> there's a fountain. Um, there's an art museum. It has its own art museum on the site, which is one of the few free art museums in Los Angeles. It has its own private collection, and it hosts weekly, uh, not weekly, I don't know, every two or three months a new show. At the moment, there's a Disney artist showing. Mm. I just want to give you a, a few little facts so you have an idea what kind of place this is. Um, this is called the Great Mausoleum, which is like a five-story uh, mausoleum for crypts that is um, camera surveilled. In that building is also the stained glass reproduction of the Da Vinci's Last Supper that you just saw in the video. Um, there's multiple little churches like this one on the site. All these churches are reproductions of British or English churches that are all um, from, the child, from the childhoods of um, famous British write writers like Rudyard Kipling. In this building is the largest painting in the world. You also saw that in the video. And this building is kind of structured around that, constructed around that building, uh, that painting. Okay. It's called the, the Disneyland of Cemeteries. It's a weird place. It has reproductions of hundreds of uh, European Greco-Roman style uh, statues <clears throat> and is home to, I don't know, a whole array of Hollywood stars that are buried there. Let's talk about the founder of this cemetery. His name is Hubert Eaton. He was a businessman from Missouri. He came from a Baptist academic background, but he decided to um, become a metallurgist, a chemist, and started to work for the most influential mining corporations in the United States. Until he had enough money and contacts, maybe he also joined uh, the Freemason Lodge, so maybe through these contacts, he uh, opened his own silver mine in Nevada. So by 30, he was already a millionaire, which meant a lot at that time. We're talking about the 1910s. <clears throat> but then the impossible happened. The silver mine flooded, and he was broke. And he had to move to Los Angeles and became a salesman for Forest Lawn Cemetery. That was a cemetery already set up by business people from San Francisco. And he was a salesman for before need cemetery lots. That means before you die, kind of like an insurance salesman, you buy already a plot at a cemetery and you kind of pay it in rates until you're actually, you're actually dead and then you don't have to pay it anymore. Your family doesn't have to pay it. Eaton pretty fast advanced to the manager of Forest Lawn and kind of restructured the way that the company worked. And he publicized himself as the builder of Forest Lawn. Yeah, the genius who kind of came across this plot of land and saw the qualities in it and told this narration that every uh, big corporation needs that doesn't have a history or tradition to go on. This is the builder's creed. That is a stone plate at the Great Mausoleum in which the builder kind of describes his vision of Forest Lawn. Let me read you this little excerpt about it from it. <clears throat> I, therefore, I therefore know the cemeteries of today are wrong because they depict an end, not a beginning. They have consequently become unsightly stone yards full of inartistic symbols and depressing customs, places that do nothing for humanity save a practical act and that not well. I therefore prayerfully resolve on this New Year's Day, 1917,
that I shall endeavor to build forest lawn as different as unlike other cemeteries, as sunshine is unlike darkness, as eternal life is unlike death. I shall try to build at Forest Lawn a great park, devoid of misshapen monuments and other costumary signs of earthly death, filled with towering trees, sweeping lawns, splashing fountains, beautiful statuary, cheerful flowers, and so on and so on. This could be read as some type of ideological manifesto of a new type of cemetery paradigm. And Hubert Eaton is going to become the significant funeral director of the early 20th century. And Forest Lawn Memorial Park is going to be the role model for necronomic um, cemetery management. Eaton massively diversified the, the services of Forest Lawn. They built their own mortuary on the site in order to store the dead themselves so they didn't have to go through morticians from outside. They centralized the coffin production. They had their own hearst fleet, their own flower shop. Um, in the 1930s, they offered funerals, burials, viewings, monuments, floral displays, crypts, vaults, mortuary trust bonds, and life insurances. The churches built on Forest Lawn also offered weddings and baptisms. So in the back, Forest Lawn is kind of structured like a, like a for-profit running company. And in the front, it's organized and it's, and it's looking and landscaped like a cultural recreational park for visitors and tourists. There was nothing, there, there was actually nothing strange at the time. A lot of cemeteries looked like parks and also functioned like parks and were tourist attractions. It had these really wide streets and pathways so you could enter it with, with cars. Yeah, in American cemeteries you kind of drive with a car to the close to where the lot of um, the dead, your, your deceased are. And then this is maybe easier to see from here. So it looks, it looks like a park. Yeah, it has these trees planted everywhere so the visitor can stroll in the, shed, in the shade. And it just has these, these meadows but if you zoom in closely, look from the top, then you can see that all of these are graves. But Eaton did a really, really clever thing. He removed the gravestones and replaced them with these um, unified bronze markers, like in war cemeteries. So everybody got one of these markers. And that did two, created two really, really nice uh, effects. One, the park, uh, the lawns of the park look like a, create visibility and it creates this feeling that you're in a park. And on the other hand, it creates this demarcation line between normal customers who just pay for a, for a bronze marker and wealthy customers who have the money and the means to pay extra for a mausoleum or for a statuary or for special niches where they would be buried. So up here in the top part of the cemetery, if I zoom in, you see there are these terraces. And these terraces beat, uh, they, they give space for a little statuary and for art that you have to pay um, to buy of Eaton um, to build monuments. Oh yeah, this is the David sculpture on this side. And this is what it looks like inside of the Great Mausoleum. And most of these sites are actually um, exclusive. They're not accessible by, for the public. And most of the Hollywood stars are buried there. Um, I can read you a little list of people that are buried there. Harold Lloyd, Ida Lupino, Ernst Lubitsch, two Marx brothers, James Stewart, Elizabeth Taylor, Humphrey Bogart, Walt Disney, Michael Jackson. This idea that people could be pushed uh, into spending more money into um, building memorial architecture, Eaton called the memorial impulse. And he used this kind of concept to, um, to give, his, give his sales agents so that they have an incentive 
to actually convince the customers that they face to spend more money, to create a certain type of relevancy for their, um, for their deceased and for themselves. And, um, and in, order, in order to somehow deal with their grief and with the situation they're, they're in. Okay, let's picture this for a second. Let's, we're, in, we're in the 40s, maybe in the 50s. There's no internet. I just lost somebody and I come into a funeral home. Okay, of course I feel terrible. <coughs> I'm grieving. Um, I feel guilty. And I'm somewhat pressured by time because of course the dead body is decaying and I have to make a decision. I don't really want to go through comparing different funeral homes and I don't, really, I don't really have the power or the time to do that. And I'm confronted by a product for the first time in my life that I have no standard of comparing to. And I have to, sp I have to spend a lot of money. I know it's going to be expensive. Um, and for an American, for an average American at the time, it was the third largest expenditure in a lifetime after a house and a car. So that leaves me somewhat indifferent to the amount of money that I have to spend because I know it's going to be expensive. This vulnerability, the salespeople of, of Eaton's sales strategy uh, exposed and tried to use. And they called the sales strategy grief therapy. It has nothing to do with actual, actual um, psycholo psychological counseling. Um, but it shows in as much they were, int they were kind of looking at psychology and using the salesmanship version of death drive or kind of a Christian afterlife in order to sell, to sell their product. <clears throat> so the mission of, a, of the death industry are two things. For one, it's to create this kind of space where um, the customer can, can spend money and can, can, access, um, can, can access a lot of, um, or can, can transform their debt into access in, in this kind of cultural uh, park with statues. And on the other hand, create this possibility for, for the for the survivors to sacrifice, yeah? To go through this kind of traumatic experience and give them at, at hand some type of um, cathartic release through money. In the late 19th century, the role of the undertaker was fading. That was the person that comes to your house where the dead was lying and all the family members and everybody who wanted to say their last goodbyes to the dead would come to the house. And there, were, there, there was called the views and the wakes. The undertaker would come, they put, um, he or she puts the corpse on ice, the dead is washed, put in a coffin, transported to a graveyard or a, or a cemetery, and is buried. With the invisibilization of the dead, the wakes and the viewings are kind of pushed out of the private homes into privately owned funeral homes. And at the same time, with the growing urbanization in the West, in European and American cities, cemeteries are also pushed outside of the cities, out to the fringes of the cities, and became these rural, natural cemeteries. This creates two new this, this creates a couple of new tasks for the undertaker. First of all, the transport of the dead, and second of all, the storage of the dead. This exclusion now, this delay creates a really, really interesting moment of suspension that allows the undertaker for a magical trick to transform himself or herself into the prestigious funeral director, emphasizing its ability to organize a staged production. The director manages the set, scenography, music, light, the accommodation of the viewers, even the post-production and the distribution of the final product. In, in the cast, supporting roles 
in keeping with Roman death cults, the director hires actors and actresses to perform the eulogies. The main act of the drama, of course, it's the glory and the glamour of its star. The funeral director summons the entire tradition of Western theater, from Antigone to Hamlet, to produce this haunting return of the dead. While the audience is occupied with something else, yeah, picking the right morning clothes, signing contracts, the dead are being stolen and hushed away underneath their eyes to be revoked, altered, and amplified and return as cosme cosmetically enhanced as a Sunday dress wearing, rose water smelling, larger than life body. The body, the star. This body is covered with the signs of militarism, white privilege, and slavery. The secret ingredient to the production of this star body, the MacGuffin to the suspense, is called formaldehyde. During the years of the Civil War in the United States from 1861 to 1865, a Dr. Thomas Holmes um, asks for permission to embalm the fallen soldiers. The idea is to send the soldiers back to their families all across the Union, and so they have to be embalmed in order to be preserved to stay, to, to, so they don't decompose in the, um, in the transport. He said that he embalmed over 4,000 bodies and charged $100 each, and he came back to New York as a rich man. Abraham Lincoln was shot in April 1965, um, just shortly before the Civil War ended, and just weeks after the abolition of slavery. His assassin was an actor, and he shot Abraham Lincoln in a theater while watching a play. Abraham Lincoln's funeral was a huge three-week-long event, the largest funeral in American history. He was traveling with a Hearst train through 13 different cities, where he was taken out in each city and placed in state, that means in a state building, his body was presented in a state building so that people could say their last farewells. This route was restaging his route as a president-elect to Washington. This was, yeah, this was a huge event and a major, major event in the American uh, psyche. And this event was only made possible by the technology of embalming, of course. Because Abraham Lincoln's body could be embalmed for such a long time, he could be transported and presented. So this was not only the largest funeral in US history, it was also the first publicity event for the modern death industry and for embalming itself. This is the grave of uh, Abraham Lincoln in Springfield, Illinois. Um, in the 40 years after he was buried for the first time, he was exhumed multiple times and the grave was relocated on and off. Let's jump ahead into the 60s at this time where the funeral, the way we learned it just now, rapidly changed. The, the Pope lifts the ban on cremation, Night of the Living Dead comes out, and, I, uh, and into this time, Hubert Eaton dies. <laughs> Eternity, 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 eternity. 
Eton was embalmed and had a glorious funeral. A ribbon of movie stars, Freemasons and white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, trailing behind the hearst up the meandering pathways to the great mausoleum. Where Eton, Eton's tomb was erected, the crowd listened under sobs and weeps to a touching eulogy by Eton's good friend Walt Disney. Children lit candles as teenagers blew handkerchiefs and adults laid flowers. And weepingly, the crowd stepped into the glaring sun of Los Angeles. They stepped into the forest lawn-owned limousines and left him lying there, perhaps Walt threw a last glance at the last supper and told the guard to turn the lights off. And then it became quiet. But Hubert couldn't die. He lay still, quiet, listened for the visitors and the audio guide. For two or three days he tried, but he couldn't, until shivers and shakes caught him, thoughts running through formaldehyde brains. Of course, he figured, that was perfectly normal. He was going to be resurrected. He waited for the lid to open and reveal the stairs to the gates of heaven, that the Lord might come and reach its hand out to him and bring him home. But nothing happened. He had to push the lid aside himself. It was nighttime. The moon was throwing its sliver of light onto the Last Supper. And there he stood in his morning clothes, ragged pale, the body couldn't rot from the embalming fluid, but was slightly moldy. He climbed out of the tomb and looked out of the window, and to his surprise he found the moonlit lawns crowded with bored bodies hanging out at their bronze markers, scratching asses. And the longer he stared, the more undead creeped out of their caskets and crypts and collectively wandered through the hallways and lawns, waiting for a job, perhaps. So in the 60s, all of a sudden, these two critiques arise <coughs> on the relationship that we have with the dead and with the death industry. This is a set shot of Night of the Living Dead. This is George Romero with a paint bucket. And... Like the production of the dead and bound body, the production of the zombie body as well carries the signs of white supremacy and slavery that starts with the cultural appropriation of the idea of the zombie from Haitian Vodun, where the zombie is, is a dead slave that is not allowed peace after death, but is forced to um, eternal labor on the, on the plantains. And that continues with, with the reinterpretation of Romero's zombie apocalypse films, where the zombies are used as a metaphor for consumerism, for white supremacy, for militarism, and class disparity. This is the cast of Night of the Living Dead. The film portrays this group of people that kind of retreat into this country house in Pennsylvania and they're besieged by this group of ghouls, by this group of zombies and little by little each of them gets bit and turned into a zombie. The only survivor is the African American um, actor which is in the end shot by a white police squad that is raiding the zombie, the zombie siege. The stars of the film, the actors that we see here, are all people that are not zombies, are not portrayed as zombies. In fact, the zombies are some type of normative mass, some type of dead, undead singularity that is attacking the, the stars through which perspective we are watching the film. And it turns out that we actually find very little movies where we're looking through the perspective of the zombie. Most of the films, most of the films, the zombie functions as this kind of other, othered, othering, um, 
projection screen that we that we can use as a as a metaphor, and that is that is different actually to other um, post-human horror conditions and monsters like the vampire or the ghost or mutants um, like the werewolf. These these horror conditions usually have a personality, and we're, and we're looking through their perspective. But at the same time, the zombie as this projection screen um, proved to be very malleable and adaptable to different audiences. And in so much as that it functions as a trigger machine and kind of can present us with affects, whatever affects we, we need to see. So there's, there's terror and horror and disgust, of course, but zombies can also function as empathy, as empathy triggers or can make us laugh or ridicule. So the zombie is excluded, the zombie is invisibilized, and to read this with Baudrillard, who said that just as the mad, the children, the old and the poor, the, un the dead have become excluded. Yeah? It's not normal anymore to be dead. Um, it's probably even more normal to be undead than to be dead. And just as the asylum, the prison and the factory have dissolved into our metropolises and have kind of collapsed on top of the metropolis that we live in and are accessible at all nodes. So, I quote, the cemetery no longer exists because modern cities have entirely taken over their function as ghost towns and cities of death. The necropolises of the United States are the manufacturing cities of the Rust Belt. Stripped of their infrastructure, of their economic relevance, um, of their jobs and of their white population. Like Detroit, Michigan, like Cleveland, Ohio, like Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. All of these are swing states in the Trump election. And we can see that the largest um, voter amount that kind of pushed Trump into presidency comes from the Midwest and the Rust Belt area. The zombie also has a right to a public space. Yeah? They hang out and they linger in the streets and parking lots and malls. And these streets and parking lots and malls, these public spaces are public spaces of the Rust Belt. And perhaps that's why their um, zombie walks are such an interesting and, 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 and well-known, well-received um, form of demonstration. Maybe you, you know it. People dress up as zombies and walk down the streets, take over the streets as a uh, demonstration. There's, the, the other, there's another, another critique that arises in the 60s that stands diametrical to the idea of the zombie, to the imagination of the zombie, and also to the production of the dead embalmed body through the death industry. And this other critique is going to perform a huge blow on the death industry through a really simple techno-materialist uh, solution. Yeah, cremation produces a different type of body um, that, is, that can be politicized in a very different way. When I published my book in, in 1963, um, it created a huge outcry and, and many people uh, came out to talk in radio shows and newspaper articles about the exploitation that the death industry caused them. And at the time, in the 60s, um, cremation posed this, this um, opposition and this real, real political um, solution to a problem. Yeah? So cremation actually gained a huge, huge impulse at the time. And another thing that absolutely coincidentally happened at this time was that the ban, that the ban on cremation was lifted by the Pope. So for hundreds and hundreds of years, um, cremation was not possible for, for Christians and was even used uh, in Inquisition and in the feminicides of the, of, of the witch hunts um, to kill heathens and kill pagans. So last year, in 2015, we have this crazy historical flipping point where cremation for the first time in the United States becomes becomes more um, is more used than burials. Yeah, in Great Britain, this is, has been a longer story. So there's already 75% of people that are cremated. In Switzerland, even more than, more than 80%. So 
Statistically, cremation is favored by higher educated, younger middle class Americans, um, mostly on the West Coast and in the Northeast and in the cities. The lowest cremation rates are still found in rural and religious communities in the South and in the Rust Belt. So as these two critiques stand in, yeah, try to grasp um, and critique the death industry, um, the imagination, imaginative space of the zombie and the real political space of, of cremation, um, necronomics has long been, has long shifted and changed and switched its, um, its mechanisms to encompass all of these critiques in one fuzzy neoliberal bubble. In 1940, Ronald Reagan gets married to Jane Wyman on Forest Lawn Cemetery. He's an actor in Hollywood and an anti-communist, outspoken. In the 60s, he decides to change professions, switch professions, and he goes into politics, and he runs for gov governor of California and becomes governor of California from 1967 to 1975 through Berkeley riots and everything. After that, he runs for presidency, and from 81 till 89, he is president of the United States. Um, he militarizes Nixon's war on drugs, sends hundreds of thousands of um, African Americans, Americans to jail. He pushes for a new arms race with the Soviet Union. But of course, he's most famous for massive tax cuts, kind of a flattening of tax cuts. <coughs> and the implementation of neoliberal reforms that allow for, together with Mark Thatcher and Hu Jintao, that allow for this kind of um, multi-corporate, multinational corporate world we live in, um, that we live in today. Yeah, less state intervention, globalized markets, free markets. The death industry has their very own players that emerge from this time. This is the Service Corporation International. Let's take a little look at their website. This is different, the different brands that they have. I wanted to show you the board of directors. What Hubert Eaton and Forrest Lawn was to the early 20th century death industry, Service Corporation International is to big data capitalism. The board of directors is run by bankers. And let's, I want to give you a little bit of a hint of how they're approaching death industry and how it works for them. So they're based in Houston and they're doing data analysis of each state and looking at funeral, privately owned funeral homes and how they're performing. And they're watching these, these funeral homes for a couple of years. And, and also, they're also looking at what type of audience they're targeting, um, what type of religions, what type of race, what type of classes. And then they target single uh, funeral homes and buy them up. But they keep their names, um, they keep the names present, uh, like, they leave the names of the funeral homes and the owners of the funeral homes become the managers of those funeral homes now. So in the front, everything looks the same and you have no idea that it's a service corporation international business, but in the back, the dead are logistically outsourced to these um, yeah, logistics centers where they're embalmed and then they're um, put back into the funeral home. All the products, the coffins, the caskets, all the paraphernalia, um, are dictated by Service Corporation International. And um, they tried to buy huge parts of the European market in the late 90s, but it somehow didn't really work. Perhaps that embalming was not really functional in Europe, or perhaps that um, a lot of the cemeteries and a lot of the, yeah, a lot of the cemeteries are actually state-owned, so it was not as easy to privatize, privatize these things. So they divested all the European market again and started merging and buying up all the other big players in the death industry in 
in the United States, and they also bought up um, the Neptune Society, which was the largest, um, the largest corporation that offered cremations <coughs> in the United States. And it turned out that cremation is, uh, is actually a very, very profitable business, because all of a sudden we can sell the body of the dead back to the survivors, back to the customers. And the ashes of the dead turned out to be this perfect, commodifiable um, mass, almost like the clay of the golem that can be formed into all types of com commodities, into necklaces, into diamonds, and um, yeah, into seedlings, and, and sold back to the, to the customers. In the recent years, they're concentrating more on their dig dignity memorial brand. <coughs> And they have these personalized, targeted sample plans. Depending on what type of personality you have, you can get a can get a plan. Let's look at the artist, maybe. <laughs> what do you want to know? The, consider your celebration to be a private art show dedicated to what you loved and whom you loved. Display your lifetime of passion in creative ways that will personally speak to those who inspired you in your chosen medium. The personalized targeting and proliferation of consumer products of big data death industry is not unlike the mechanisms employed by the Trump campaign. When on the night of the 9th of November it became clear that the national polling sites ooh, massively false predicted the outcome of the election, the New York Times declared the death of data. Who killed it? Who administered that death? <clears throat> Maybe it would be more accurate to speak of undead data when we think of the micro-targeted voter ads of Clinton and Trump voters published by Cambridge Analytica through the Trump campaign. The Trumpist zombies released during campaign and now presidencies, the questionnaires, the clickbait graves and fake Facebook news declaring the death of Hillary Clinton, leave personal, pers personality traces for brain-hungry data ghouls that linger in the pseudo-public spaces of social media sites of Rust Belt metro areas in the same way that the ghouls in Romero films linger in the pseudo-public spaces of Rust Belt necropolises and paralyze us with trigger machines through personalized haunting affects. And like the zombie, this data is viral and contagious. Even the data of polling institutes were post-factually infested until the last moment convinced of fake truths. Immortality had long been a privilege of the powerful. Before it was democratized by 
monotheistic religions and kind of turned into this normativizing vehicle where everybody has a right to immortality. We could write an entire history on the preservation of statesmen and how power is obsessed with the dream to resurrect these statesmen. Trump politics has resurrected a whole lot of dead concepts, dormant and preserved in US society, including misogynism, racism, state exceptionalism, and fascist demagogue tropes. Donald Trump has used metaphors, rally symbols, statements to resurrect the political traditions of Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan. He called himself the law and order candidate, as Nixon did, and he used the same campaign slogan that Reagan used. How is Donald Trump going to be buried? Let's look at the, the weird and peculiar tradition of burying dead presidents in the 20th century. Franklin D. Roosevelt was the first president um, who decided that all of the presidential papers should be public and available to the public. Before they were private property, but through him a couple of laws were passed and now every president has to publicize the presidential papers. Um, they're protected and, and governed by the National Archives and Records Administration, which is um, headed by the Archivist of the United States, which is a beautiful title. <clears throat> This is the Presidential Library of Richard Nixon. That houses all of the Watergate tapes. Um, the Richard Nixon Museum. This is the grave of Richard Nixon. Here a little bit in the sh shade. This is the grave of the First Lady. This is the birth house of Richard Nixon. So this is a total preservative institution constructed on top of the birth place of Richard Nixon. This is his helicopter. You can see it if it's yeah. This is the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library. It houses a hangar with different Air Force Ones that Ronald Reagan used instead of this building. There's a jet. There's a piece of the Berlin Wall here. You can see the shadow of it. And it also houses the death the grave of Ronald Reagan and Nancy Reagan in this little rotunda. Yeah. It's a museum as well that shows the Hollywood years, the ranching years of Ronald Reagan. It's a, spe it's a, it's a spectacle, yeah, an event. Recently, presidential libraries have become these multimedia institutes that are connected as study institutions um, to universities. All of Trump's presidential papers, his staff meeting protocols, his interviews, his Twitter account, will be publicly available, ha have to be publicly available. They will be connected to a resurrected Trump University as a study center. And following the example of Nixon and Reagan, they will be constructed above his birth house in Jamaica, Queens, that also is going to uh, house his grave, a freezer, he will be cryogenetically preserved, ready for resurrection at the hand of any future president who needs him.